So now if we could turn to our panel, please. Gary, could I perhaps ask you to come in first? I'm sure you must be tired of people referring to economics as a dismal science. Um, yesterday, there was a, a, a round table where we looked at some of these issues, and you were incredibly optimistic, I felt, at least from a, from a Scottish perspective. So perhaps could you um, build on some of the, the points that Sarah has made and, and Susan talked about in her keynote address, but perhaps put that in a more specific Scottish context for us? Okay, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here and speak. So I think I would like to give you a perspective of government and how government views these issues. So I think as Sarah, Susan, and other speakers have said, we live in an unprecedented time of change, both political, technological, economic environment, and socially. And in essentially what we're talking about is system change. We need to think about, as Dame Susan described, the three legs of the stool. For us in government, that's economic, social, and environmental and that any, any change that we have can be driven across those three pillars. Uh, I wanted to say a little bit about the approach to government in Scotland, which links to the SDGs and, in, and is rooted in a framework based on a national performance framework, which essentially is an outcomes-based framework. It was introduced in Scotland in 2007, and essentially it, it recognises that to achieve outcomes uh, you have to drive the whole system, the outcomes are inter interdependent on each other, and that it takes a different form of government, it takes a different type of, of approach. So that's very much embedded in Scotland. It was introduced in 2007, and I'll say how it's developed over that period very, very briefly. But essentially, the 11 outcomes that are there are linked to the SDGs. So if you like, it reflects Scotland's national plan to achieve the SDGs. It has a purpose at its centre, which is a strategic direction, and, and that reflects the, essentially the purpose is about the well-being of Scotland, both social, environmental, and economic. Uh, also, which I think is really important in thinking about climate change also, it also has a bit of described what type of society you want to be, and within that, um, it recognises the rule of law. When we were doing this exercise, we consulted across all of Scotland, and the thing that people came back with, what was the most important for citizens of Scotland? It was how they were treated. So at the heart of it, there's something about um, a society which treats people with kindness and dignity, and that's really, really important in that, in that context. Let me come on to the, the economic approach now, and I'll say a little bit about uh, Scotland's approach to climate change as well. So essentially when we were relaunching our national performance framework last year in 2018, the first minister at the launch said essentially that GDP and growth was an end to a means. So essentially it was only important in the extent to which it enhanced the environment or supported improvements in the quality of life or enhanced opportunity. So from, from early on in this government's approach, there's been very much looking at uh, the pillars of economic opportunity, reducing inequality, and sustaining the environment. The, the approach the Scottish government have placed on the environment now is, as people have said, is recognised internationally, commitments to net zero by 2045. In the most recent programme for government, uh, we're looking at a three billion green investment portfolio, commitments to decarbonise fully our electric uh, network by 2035, investment in public transport, bus priority lanes, looking at a pilot scheme in the Highlands and Islands for electric planes, uh, climate change emergency skills plan, alongside a host of other initiatives around regulations, around uh, buildings, houses, everything to manage the transition because this is a whole system change that we will we will have to will have to put in place so it's really important that that, that we recognize essentially what we're doing as we're talking about system change on the economy we've been in that space for a number of years policies such as inclusive growth fair work the business pledge child care gender equality are all about trying to change the system and what we recognise is we can't change one part of the system 
and isolation of the other parts. So business has a crucial role. The financial system has a massive role in this. It can either be a driver of change or it can, it can follow the system. As we know, systems change requires a different perspective. They tend to be non-linear, dynamic. There's tipping points within them. They respond to signals. And once they change, they change very quickly. If you look at the papers today, there's more about climate change strikes. So thinking about, from your perspective, where are you in that? Where are you in that change? Are you part of the change? Are you waiting till it changes beyond that? So it's about changing norms. It's about changing how we think about things. And as, as our moderator, Simon, said, well, I, I was relatively optimistic yesterday. And the reason I was optimistic was, I think, particularly for small countries, we, we tend to, we can bring people together more easily. We can be more adapt, more agile at change. And the example I gave yesterday was uh, more than 10 years ago, or around 10 years ago, 10% of our electricity generation was renewable. And that related to hydro schemes we put in place essentially after the, after the Second World War. 10 years on, 75% of our gross electricity consumption now is renewables in Scotland. And over 50% of that comes from, from wind and um, wind and tide. So, it's, so over a sh very short period of time, we've managed to generate that change. But Sarah says it's more, than, it's more than energy, it's a whole system change. And the final point I'd say, in a sense, is if we look to nature, I think Dame Susan mentioned uh, Dieter Helm's lecture, uh, we're looking at natural capital as well. We, have a, we are lucky in Scotland, we have a, a wealth of natural capital. Uh, we published accounts earlier this year which valued the stock of natural capital, including our ecosystems, air, water, over 300 billion. We have over a third of the UK's natural capital. And natural capital is really, really important in this wider system perspective about how we use that to frame things going forward. W one final point, our First Minister will speak tomorrow. She'll touch on a wider range of uh, initiatives and her personal commitment. If you're interested, she gave a TED talk in Edinburgh in August on what a wellbeing economy would look like. And central to that was the environment, drawn on the work from Adam Smith. We're part of an, an international initiative called the Wellbeing Economy Government launched last year with Iceland and New Zealand. And really, all of that, from different perspectives, is about system change. As Susan said, it's a three-legged stool. And if it's out of balance, we can't sit on it. So, so I hope slightly, so I haven't got into externalities, climate change, or anything like that. But I hope that gives you a perspective of how we approach these type of issues within Scotland. Well, that's super. Thank you very much. Gary, um, and if I could perhaps turn to Dr. Adetunton now. Um, so, Gary could have introduced the Scottish National Performance Framework and sort of broadened beyond um, looking at environment and the climate to talking about social and economic well-being too. Um, I know that you're kind of keen to pick up on the, the sort of some of the the other SDGs as well, particularly looking at issues of financial inclusion um, in uh, in the Nigerian and, and wider African context. Um, but also, could I ask you both look at, are we perhaps seeing this through something of a privileged sort of European lens as well? Is there a, a different perspective, a more global perspective we need to look at this through? Um, thank you, and it's a privilege to be here today. Let me step back and make the point that um, if you look at the stage of development in most African countries today, um, what is most paramount for us is around inclusive growth. I haven't said that um, climate is not very important, but, and I'll come to that shortly. Globally, four of the 10 fastest and growing economy in the world, they are in Africa, and we are privileged that our principal head office is in Nigeria, which is the largest economy in Nigeria. By far, Nigeria is also the country in Africa with the largest population. The issue has always been, how do you orchestrate an inclusive growth? And that is where an institution like ourselves, uh, we've been um, in the forefront of promoting financial inclusion. By the way, 
we see financial inclusion in a much broader sense. Um, and financial inclusion is at least central to our ability as a country and as a continent to achieve at least eight of the sustainable development goals. What have we done? If you step back about four or five years back, the critical issue across the continent is lack of access to financial services. And when people do not have access to financial services, then how the millennium goes around addressing poverty, addressing hunger, providing health and well-being becomes a challenge. So institutions like ourselves, also spearheaded by the central bank, came out with guidelines designed to stimulate interest in terms of getting more people into the banking space. Um, if I use First Bank, where I'm the CEO, as an example, we have products, we have specific offerings targeted at people at the base of the pyramid. And I would say we've been relatively successful. Today, First Bank across Nigeria, we have over 36,000, 35,000 agents across the nook and cranny of Nigeria providing financial services products, micro lending, micro pension um, to various people over and above offering basic financial services. We've also utilized technology using, making use of the quick code called USSD, that's the unstructured um, supplementary service data to reach population at the base of the pyramid. We started that um, about four years ago, and today we have about close to about nine million people who are actively transacting on that platform. Indeed, um, end of August was a uh, landmark uh, date for us because we celebrated the fact that we have processed over two trillion transactions on that uh, particular network, and that's significant. However, given the fact that First Bank is not just a Nigerian institution, we're also present in a number of significant economies in Africa. For example, we're in Ghana, we own a bank in the DRC Congo. We are also rolling out this agency banking and the USSD platform in those locations. Again, everything geared towards promoting financial inclusion and getting more and more people into the, uh, within the financial bracket. And it's been quite useful, for example, in Nigeria, assisting government to also promote its own agenda of empowering the people at the base of the pyramid, um, distributing social um, money, and also helping to stimulate agriculture. Um, so financial inclusion is very important. Leveraging technology has also been quite useful in achieving that. Um, we've also used our um, strength as a bank to also act in a very targeted way around empowering people at the base of the pyramid. So we do financial literacy week across the entire Nutan country. Again, as part of promoting people, getting people to understand why it's important to keep their money with the banks rather than keep their money at home and the opportunities that comes uh, with that. So for us, it's, um, we are seeing a bit of um, green financing, green energy, but it's still relatively at its infancy. Um, Nigeria and most part of Africa, we are rich in solar energy. Um, that is beginning to take off. We're also beginning to see a couple of uh, wind um, power projects. Um, so for example, an institution where I sit as a non-executive director own a commercial wind farm in a country in Africa called Cape Verde. So, but that's still relatively as it's infant. However, what has gained ground, which is quite significant, it's financiers like ourselves also putting environmental and social impact as a cardinal principle around lending, which I see as a precursor to responsible financing. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a great um, overview of um, not just Nigeria, but you know, the continent of Africa more broadly. Um, and I think we, all the panelists, have kind of introduced the aspects of um, sustainability, responsibility, um, going beyond just the environment that, that we wanted to get to with this. 
Um, I suspect, well, all of us on the panel agree, I suspect probably everybody in the room agrees about the importance, and the importance of achieving the sustainable development goals of supporting the transition to a low carbon world, the just transition and so on. We are probably all in violent agreement about that. Um, but Sarah, as you said, we can't wait for the risks to materialize. We have to act today to solve some of tomorrow's problems. Um, how do we act today to solve some of tomorrow's problems? We also have to serve the needs of the economy and society today. That transition isn't as easy, perhaps, as, as we wish it would be. So any hints, tips, ideas, suggestions as to how we do that? Sarah? Uh, let me have a go at answering that question, because as a cold, hard, analytical central banker, it's exactly the kind of question we ask ourselves. What we're trying to do is work with the financial system to think about what risks are going to materialize in future. So the stress test of the financial system that I mentioned before is designed to stretch horizons so that people realize today the consequences of their decisions, even if those decisions are going to materialize, uh, the consequences of them are going to materialize many decades ahead. So what we're doing is setting out a variety of possible future states of the world. The physical risks have materialized. There's been an early and orderly transition to a zero carbon economy. There's been a late, sudden, disruptive uh, transition to uh, a low carbon economy. And if you can see the risks in those states of the world, it then informs you about the different decisions that you can take today. So we're hoping, as I said, through the stress test of the system that we're doing, to make people understand the consequences of the decisions that are being taken uh, today, so that those decisions are taken differently. I mean, if you wanted to move away from being perceived as a, as a, as a cold, hard central banker um, and to pick up on kind of Gary for an important word of kindness, if you wanted to be kinder, how about capital relief for, for green capital relief for banks? That would be a kind thing to do. So capital needs to be grounded in risk. What I've just described is designed to size this risk as we look ahead. Capital requirements have typically been set through the rear view mirror, we've looked at what risk has materialized in the past. By definition, this risk is a forward-looking risk. And I think that we will be better able to answer the question about what should the capital requirements be once we've done this job of sizing the future risks <coughs> that we take. That's, our, that's a natural consequence of the, of the work that we are doing. So we're talking about kind of signals here, really, from uh, policymakers and regulators and so on. So, so Gary, perhaps a, an economist's view on perhaps signals, but maybe also nudges for consumers and things. How can we get the consumers to buy into the opportunity here for green and sustainable finance? Okay, yeah. So, so, so just to say, firstly, the role of government in particular, I think, is about changing the system, uh, regulatory or legislative setting the framework that allows sectors and players to change. But coming to the economics, econom expectations is really important in economics. We've seen once people's views change, once uh, confidence goes, it can lead to a, a quick change in market conditions. We've seen it at the tail end, at, we've seen it in the financial crisis of 2008-9. Once people realised where the problem was, there was a, a, almost a wholesale change overnight. So expectations are really important in driving systems and driving and driving change. So thinking about the power of uh, consumers, the power of individuals from a business or financial perspective, then we need to change the norms around the system. So that, and from a financial perspective, you don't want to be in the wrong side of the, of that type of change. So user user part of that and there's evidence to suggest that that 
actually those type of investments will do as well because the longer term, and as Sarah said, you're future proofing against changes that, that may marginalize your products or companies. So there, there's something really about that. And the final thing is the, there's something about the just transition. So it's got to be one that uh, at the conference I was speaking at last week at the OECD, the Secretary General mentioned that within the OECD countries, which are regarded as the more wealthy countries, 40% uh, of the population were within three months of falling into poverty. So even within the most advanced economies, there is, there is still real challenges around inequality, uh, the uh, security of employment, and so this has to be managed in a way that, that, can, that can kind of bring all of that together. So, Susan, I know you think a lot about the role of individuals in all of this and what individuals can do um, through their own actions to build stronger cultures and institutions and then through them that promote systems change. What, what more do you think we can be doing as individuals in our institutions and our business life? Um, so I'll answer your question perhaps first about institutions and wearing my you know, business hat and my finance hat, which is my background. Um, a couple of things I ponder and worry about all the time, which is in business in general, particularly the larger the organization, we tend to put things in boxes. And so for some of the issues we're talking about just now, um, you know, they initially, I think Omar said, belonged with the PR department and then went into a CSR team. And then perhaps there's a, a department somewhere that, that deals with green finance or, or whatever. But actually what needs to happen in our organizations is that these issues become totally core, totally mainstream. Um, we can't just assume that they're compartmentalized. Another thing that worries me is um, that particularly in finance, we deal in numbers, um, we deal in abstractions. That's what our products are, that's what we talk about. That's what capital is. Um, it is removed from reality in some respects. And we don't think about this, but that's what we do. I, I often, I once said to an entire audience of accountants that numbers are just one interpretation of reality. And the, the gasp was audible um, around the, the audience, but that's all numbers are. They're an interpretation of something. And if we could all learn to bring those back into the world of the real economy, as you call it, back into reality, I think that that, um, that, that would help. Um, the other thing that I worry about is we think problems are someone else's problems. So um, I was really pleased to hear you um, start off by talking about financial inclusion. That's a, a, a sphere and a place that I've spent a lot of my career working on both in the US and in this country. And um, you know that isn't a problem in uh, the continent of Africa. It's not a problem somewhere else. These are problems all over and they need to be addressed all over. So um, I think this probably doesn't answer your question, Simon, but that's typical of me. Um, but I think what we need to do is all of us understand that these are not separable, isolated um, issues, challenges that, that are for someone else, that we all have to <coughs> think about them, learn about them, speak up about them, and have the courage in our jobs day in and day out to talk about them. That's what we can do as individuals and in our institutions. No, thank you. I think you answered the question that I wish I'd asked, so that was, that was much better. Um, and then turning to Dr. Adelik, and pick up. so Susan made the point there around um, you know, not putting this in boxes, that actually uh, sort of responsible, banking responsible finance, in financial inclusion, it has to be part of the mainstream of, of finance, which I think was really how you were describing um, the, the position within your own institution and perhaps within Nigeria more, more broadly, that it's, it's not something that you do as a part of your bank, it is your bank. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, that, thank you, Suzanne, for that intervention. Um, the way we've always looked at it is exactly like that. If you set this up as a separate function or you allow it to reside somewhere, then it gets lost. Um, um, it becomes tangential to your business rather than it being an integral and a core part of your business. So what we've done, the way we've looked at it, whether it is um, financial inclusion, whether it's um, um, paying attention to the environment, irrespective of what we're doing, what we've done is that we've embedded those key policies, the key teams, they were 
integral part of our business strategy. Um, when you mainstream them, what it does for you is that the entire institution is governized behind it rather than leaving it to maybe a small team of people. What is important, which um, Susan also dwell on is, actually in the emerging market and developing country, when you don't have inclusive growth, when a significant chunk of the population is left behind, there's actually no way that the economy can reach its full potential. And I, I think um, former Prime Minister Godot Brand alluded to that fact when he made the point that the weak must always be ready to assist the, uh, the strong, sorry, must always be ready to assist the, the weak. Um, so for us, it's about sustainable development goals. It's about pushing the agenda. Coincidentally, there's, an, there's a conference that started yesterday in the federal capital in Nigeria. We call it Nigeria Economy Summit Group. And the president of the republic was there. And he said his commitment is to take, to have policies and uh, projects that will take at least 100 million people in Nigeria out of poverty. And again, he referenced this Sustainable Development Millennial Goal as the anchor through which this should be achieved. So it's not just about policy, it's about an holistic approach to dealing with issues that confront all of us all over the world. Maybe when you look at the spectrum, it probably varies across region, but broadly speaking, it's a pervasive problem globally. Great, well thank you. Well, um, now I'd like to open it up to, um, to our audience. You've been sitting very quietly and, and patiently since the beginning of, beginning of the day. So um, there's a couple of microphones uh, going around for questions and brief comments. We have three house rules, uh, please. Firstly, please wait for the microphone to to come to you, however loud you think your voice are, people behind you won't be able to hear. Secondly, please tell us who you are. And thirdly, please do keep it to short questions and comments. No lengthy statements or PhD theses, please. <laughs> Great, I'll put my glasses on so I can see who'd like to go first. Because of the lights, I can't really see. Yes, there's one over there, thank you. Hi, it's Amy Clark from Tribe Impact Capital, and it's a question really for Dame Susan, who alluded to it earlier, talking about culture. Do you believe that there is, and the time is now right, for a new governance framework for all businesses? Plan A is obviously not working. Maybe we need Plan B, and I do state this as a benefit corporation. Uh, so a, a lot of people talk about that. Um, I think you can have a new governance framework or you can simply operate your business differently. I think what matters, and the framework might force this to happen or not, is that within any kind of business, you understand who you're serving, who your customers are, above and beyond anything else. That's what you need to understand and you need to keep that front and center. And understanding that um, means that you have to be interacting with them, you have to be listening to them. So it's the, um, the inputs from customers and then from other stakeholders who help shape what you're doing and who need to hear what you're doing. So if today's governance framework keeps it all inside um, and doesn't let those interactions, doesn't let that listening happen, doesn't let that challenge in, then it's not working well uh, and we might need a new framework. But I think within, I mean, I've, I sit on the boards of a number of companies, I've had dealings with a number of, of, of companies, large and small as my customers when I was running a bank. And um, I think these things are in the hands of the individuals in the organizations, they can do that. But what matters is that interaction. Okay, more questions, comments from the floor, please. I've got one at the front, and then we've got the gentleman in the middle after that, please. Thank you, hi. I'm Louise Wilson from Abundance Investment. Um, I'm always struck by the number of initiatives that seem to be going on amongst organizations that I had no idea about before I attend events like this, so that's great. Um, but I'm also always struck then by how little progress we seem to make. Um, and, um, and I wanted to ask whether you think something like, this is generally to the panel, a carbon tax or a polluters tax 
what, and if, if you don't think there's any value in a kind of worldwide initiative like that, do you think there is something else that could be effective to kind of create the change we need in the speed we need it? Well, would you perhaps like to deal with that first? How, how would a carbon tax go down in a, in a country such as Nigeria, which has such a strong oil and gas sector? Or in fact, do you have carbon pricing? Of, excuse my ignorance there. Um, uh, you, know, you know, I actually made the point that when you, you look at the issues around the environment and when you look at um, where some countries are, some of those things are important today, but they are not crucially important. So um, we are gradually driving towards that, but we are still far from where we would we'll love to be. So, Gary, any economist views on carbon tax and carbon pricing? Yeah, so I think, again, uh, I was asked last week at a conference, was uh, climate change a market failure? So economists like to frame things in, in market failure. And I thought it was a bit ironic we were having this debate when wholly it was a system failure, because obviously we failed on, on climate change. So when you take a broader sp perspective then, to address this, you've got to look at all the tools that you have available whether it's cultural, regulatory, whether it's the role of business, change in society. So coming to your question about, about taxes, we tend to, if you take the market failure type approach, then we accept externalities and then we try and correct them. Climate change is beyond an exter externality now and essentially we need to eliminate carbon. So in that sense, a tax is a viable option. Uh, how you design it, how you would make it, work in a system that that didn't distort, uh, didn't, didn't overly distort, and who ultimately would bear the cost would all have to be considered. But if you can do it, I think, as one of the earlier speakers mentioned, we need a kind of strategic framework or a, an approach forward. So probably done at a multilateral level and something that would recognize that actually this is a kind of level playing field that reflects the, the new norms, the new system, and it's something that that we have to do. There's been work done, uh, I've seen uh, around the potential for shifting taxes from labor to consumption, where you could address some of the externalities and reflect the change in patterns and in, in work in the labor market. So, so without saying yes to the specifics, I don't know what you're proposing, but yes, we, we've got to look at all the levers. Susan? Uh, yeah, just a, a couple of comments about that. Um, I think, as Gary says, it's in the design, if we were to do something like that, that really matters. So you have a lot of countries that are happily measuring carbon, and carbon is only one part of this bigger problem, but happily measuring that, reducing it, but in fact, they're exporting um, carbon elsewhere in the world. So on a global basis, we're not making a whole lot of, not saying we Scotland, but that country isn't making a whole lot of difference. Um, consumption, the same thing, when uh, manufactured things are imported from elsewhere in the world. So the, the carbon is spent or used there. Um, so I think it's, it's more complicated simply than uh, taxation. Uh, there are things that financial institutions, particularly banks, could do, uh, and possibly investors, which is to um, judge the um, uh, safety uh, of a company that they might be lending money to uh, on whether that company has done anything to move forward to make itself ready for a low carbon, zero emissions world. If that business has not done that, it's going to have to spend a lot of money later. Uh, and that means it's a less good risk now. Um, so there's something about bankers and investors looking forward, uh, not just at the last three months of performance of their customers, but what the burden is on their customers financially and then making a judgment about whether or not to lend or invest. If I can just underline that point, the value of analytically thinking through what it would be the impact of a carbon tax or of, on investments I have, on loans I have made, is actually key to driving the right decisions in the real economy, just as, as Susan said. So even absent there being a carbon tax, having a discussion about exposure to carbon taxes can drive better decisions in uh, through investment, through loans, through the companies that you are um, exposed to. Great, thank you.
you. There was a question up in the about fourth row down there. Yeah. Hi, my name is Bayo Akeju from Lagos, Nigeria. Um, my question basically it depends on um, goes to Mr. Dr. De Duton on um, especially in African countries. What you notice that they are more reactionary than proactive in terms of financial inclusion. You need to have maybe R and D I mean, you need to make efforts into what you, the foreseeable future wants to be done instead of being reactionary to what is what's what is acting in the world? What I would say is that, again, it, it's similar to the comment I've made, and like I said, we do have business across Africa. What we've discovered is that a number of the smaller African countries do not have the financial firepower to do the kind of um, intervention that is required. Where we are hopeful is that with the signing of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, we are looking forward to a future where we can have maybe top 10 dominant African-wide financial institution that will have the firepower to governize what is required. So ourselves, the likes of Stambik, Standard Chartered and Co, uh, that's the world we are looking at. So, but if you go to a number of those countries, they are actually still dealing with very basic um, issues that uh, opportunity for them to think through innovation or being proactive is virtually non-existing. And I agree perfectly with you. Great, we had the question from the lady down at the front who'd been there for a while, and then there was a question up there on the left afterwards. Hello, thank you very much for a really fruitful discussion. Uh, my name is Lila Melon, I'm coming from the University of Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. And my main research interest right now is basically sustainable companies. Um, and in one of the topics of how to create a sustainable business world, uh, I came across through sustainable finance. So that was the long PhD intro. Um, thinking about the changes in corporate governance, or reflecting back to the first question that we had here, um, I just wanted to make a comment and then a question. Like, for a real sustainable change of business world, there are frameworks that are needed. Um, Comment pertains to the fact that a company right now, if it's not a multinational company, it doesn't have the resources to stay in the market long enough to recuperate their losses once they start changing their practices to being sustainable. So that's a big debate at the comp corporate law um, level. And pertaining to that, regarding the finance, as this switch to sustainability, like we know that it's not just a switch to, to a zero carbon world, but way, way more finance will need to change their way of assessing projects too. So we've been working a lot on that. So yes, any initiative for greening the finance is beautiful. But I wanted to address the whole panel, how much if something has been done to assess the projects as they are in a different manner than from a linear production system, but maybe from a circular manner. So in a linear production system, to be more clear, you have an asset backed loan, right? So you have something to count on. Why in circular economy, those assets are simply gone because we're sharing them. So at the end of the day, what you need to take as your guarantee is some kind of a contractual relationship. Are those systemic changes starting to grow inside the financial system too or not? That would be my question. Okay, it's a great question. I'll let the panel think about that. I think on the next panel, or next but one, about the principles of responsible banking, I think there's a, a colleague from ING who I know they've looked at uh, sort of circular economy in more detail in the Netherlands and perhaps we have in the UK. So I, I don't know, perhaps they may be able to address that as well at a later point. But I don't know, has the, has the Bank of England looked at all at you know, different economic models such as circular economy? Uh, so understanding how, what new financial products we might need to serve the circular economy. I think is a great uh, question. We don't have the answers to that at the moment. One of the things that uh, I mentioned that we've done is set up the Climate Financial Risk Forum, one work stream of which is about innovation and which is trying to identify where there will be frictions as we move from the current way of financing the real economy to a new way of financing the real economy. I don't think there have been particular examples come up through that of the kind that you uh, mentioned, but it's absolutely on our agenda of a, 
an area where there may be frictions that we might need to be alive to. So if you come across specifics, please let us know. That's exactly what we're trying to do to identify those frictions. Anybody else want to come on that? Or we'll, okay, we'll, we'll take, there was a question up there in the middle and then the gentleman at the front who's been waiting very patiently. Uh, David Clark, uh, Scottish Irish Finance Initiative. I was just wondering, particularly for Sarah and Susan, are you disappointed with the, C, uh, with the response of global financial leaders to this issue? Are they taking it seriously? Do any of them put it at the forefront of their planning? You talked about the siloed effect. Are any of them thinking every day, how is this going to affect my business? So it's a great question. Uh, as I said in my presentation, when we surveyed the banks and the insurers that we supervise, 10% of them were doing what I think uh, is needed, approaching this issue strategically, stretching their horizons to think about decades, not the next three monthly uh, reporting cycle. Uh, so am I disappointed that that number is 10%? Yes. Are we working with financial institutions to try and make that percentage higher? Yes. I think the, the factor that I think kind of uh, is, is an extenuating circumstance is that this is quite hard. It's new. People quite often have the right motivation but haven't yet quite worked out how practically they are going to embed this way of managing risk and identifying opportunities in how they run their business. So I think it's not a surprise that it takes time, but we need to stop that number being 10% thinking about this in the right way and have it much closer to 100%. Could I um, come at it slightly differently and say that um, very often you can talk to the chief executives of large banks, smaller banks, other kinds of institutions, and they actually both say and you think believe in certain principles, values, and so forth for their organizations. Um, you would see that in public statements by chief executives of banks in this country in 2005 and six and seven, and then the bottom fell out. Um, so I think there's something about what the chief executives, where they are, because they are the leaders, and so absolutely the right question to ask, but actually for them to understand what's happening in their organizations to make sure that the people they entrust their business to have enough confidence and enough knowledge to make decisions to influence what's going on. It's not just up to those leaders um, and what they believe. They have to ensure that the right things are happening within the organization. And if you're looking at banks, there's another element which maybe perhaps also goes to the earlier question, which is um, banks, like all businesses, if they're in the, in the public sector and in other ways not so, um, they are judged and in a way shaped by those who invest in them. So it isn't just about banks, it's about the investment community. Uh, and I've, I've said this frequently, and I know some of you are here, um, but maybe the, you're not the ones I've spoken to in the past, um, that the investment community has to stop looking at the last three months of financial performance. That isn't what success is about. Uh, and I think that banks would find it a whole lot easier to make the move, which is hard, as Sarah said, uh, if their investors also had that forward look. And perhaps just from a, again, from a, um, an, uh, an African perspective, a wider perspective, to kind of what extent are, are your peers in some of the other larger uh, banks in Nigeria and, and Africa really kind of bought into this? Would you recognise a sort of similar number to 10% as uh, uh, Sarah suggested, or would it be bigger or smaller? Um, I don't have the statistics, but um, I'm aware that... Um, at least as far as um, issues relating to sustainable development goals are concerned, as far as um, responsible, uh, responsible financing is concerned, is something that is on the front burner for most of the African financial institutions. Um, the point raised by Susan is actually very valid um, because when you are in charge of very large institutions, sometimes decisions that have been taken, some side don't go as deep within the institution as possible, and that's where I've also seen the gap 
on how, as leaders of these large institutions, we need to derive or put in place other mechanisms that enable the entire institution to be lined up behind some of these critical initiatives over and above embedding it in policies, being part of your rhetoric and everything. So same problem that we need to deal with and the jury is still out whether we are successful or not. Great, thank you. And then we had the last question here. So the gentleman just in that third row there, that's it. Yeah, this will be the last question, I'm afraid we have to. Okay, th thank you very much. Um, Dan Nixon, I work at the Mindful Finance Institute, small NGO. Um, I was interested, I was thinking about uh, the Scottish philosopher uh, and neuroscientist Imber Gilchrist has a book out and he talks about um, the two hemispheres of the brain and the fundamental ways that our left brains and right brains engage with the world. And he, he moves far beyond the kind of um, idea of you know, rational and, and emotional. And he, what really struck me listening to the discussion is um, so much of what's talked about as to what's needed in the mindset required for the changes we need speaks precisely to what he would say is the, the right hemispheric mode of engaging. So holistic thinking, a sense of purpose, um, and uh, kind of broader perspectives, words which have come up so much. And what really struck me as well is um, Susan's comment that ar around things in institutions, the way we think about things, maybe the cold, hard, analytical way of thinking of things is to put things in boxes. And this, he says, is basically the characteristic of the left brain way of thinking is to put things in boxes, categorize them. So I was just struck by this. I wondered if the panel had any thoughts on whether institutions need to cultivate mindsets which basically engage this broadly right hemispheric mode of seeing the world and, and from there then thinking how to find the right purpose, the what, the why, and the how, um, maybe in p part of their human resource strategy or, or otherwise. That's a, it's, a great, it's a great question. It picks up on so many of the themes that Susan raised in her address. And yeah, I was hoping, Gary, that perhaps some of the behavioral economics might come into this as well. Yeah, so, so t again, just I think your question was spot on around how we change mindsets. So w within the government perspective, how we operate across Scotland, the national performance framework, how our agencies interact and treat people is central to that. But essentially, in the mindset point, we, we essentially try to change norms. And norms can be influenced by loads of different factors, whether it's a CEO who's influenced by stakeholders, the share price, and in one sense, we, we've got to get into that mindset, how do we change norms? So instead of the last three months performance, it's actually about a broader external look. We did one thing in Scotland, we introduced a, a business pledge about four years ago, and it was basically asking businesses to sign up uh, around nine domains and essentially commit to, or to commit to mandatory meeting two of them and to pledge towards developing them. And they were about how they operated, how they treated their employers, how they operated in their community, their environmental responsibility, how they dealt with issues like gender. And it was quite interesting. We have over 700 companies signed up. Two thirds of them are less than, have less than 50 employees. But in one sense, the, ho the whole, essence of it is changing the mindset and if we can change the norms within sectors then businesses will compete with other pledge companies and see that's something to aspire to rather than maybe the the more market or previous driven norms around price and lowest cost so th there is definitely something about changing systems norms and driving people to that regard any reflections final reflections from other panelists Just, just one small thing that uh, I've always believed that um, we make things happen and we make change happen. Changes happen if you have a mixture of carrots and sticks. And we hear a lot about the sticks, which is, uh, as a banker, it's regulation. Uh, um, it's, uh, it's the incredibly depressing view of climate change and, and everything we hear about, we need to make sure we've got some carrots there. Uh, and maybe that is the other side of the brain or maybe it's the cortex on the outside or whatever. But there's something about the brain and about human beings that will react and, and, and will make them act um, more effectively if there's something positive in it. And so it's maybe all of our jobs to think about where's the opportunity, where's the good thing, what's the thing that gets us motivated and excited uh, to deal with all the bad stuff.
Thank you. And I would say that changing mindsets is exactly what the Ethical Finance Hub and this Ethical Finance Summit is, is trying, trying to do. It's a responsibility, I think, for all of us to go out from here and try and encourage those we work with, um, if they're not perhaps as committed as, as we may be uh, to some of, these, some of these issues, to try and help them understand and change their mindsets too. It's something we try and do through our own organisation at the Chartered Banker Institute.